So hello everybody in this session of numeric methods, I like to continue uh, discussing approximating partial derivatives, uh, dv by d theta, theta some parameter of evaluation v that is uh, performed or obtained using the Monte Carlo method because the Monte Carlo method has some subtle issues. Okay, so we already discussed this in the last session, partial derivatives of Monte Carlo valuations. So the issue is that if you perform a Monte Carlo valuation with uh, inside a payoff function f of a random variable, then if f has uh, some discontinuities yeah, or some points where it's not differentiable, uh, then this can lead to issues because in the Monte Carlo you have a sum of uh, functions that is uh, that, that are not uh, possibly at some points not differential. We looked at a nice little example. So our example was that we created here this uh, random variable x. by a stochastic process. So very simple, just a scaled shifted Brownian motion. So X of capital T is X zero plus Sigma W of capital T. So just a shifted normal distribution. So just a normal distribution. And we looked at these two small example here, calculate the expectation of a linear function applied to this random variable and calculate the expectation of a discontinuous function, so the indicator function. And uh, let me look at this guy again. So we implemented this in the computer. We were using centered finite differences and had this little program. Okay, so maybe I fix a typo here. Um, yeah, but, but let's comment uh, the linear function out and just look at the plot for the discontinuous function. So here I'm using very few passes. It's the expectation of the indicator function. Um, and I plot this indicator function now for different initial values. So depending on where my distribution is, there will be more or less mass in this expectation of the indicator function. So you would expect that what you get looks a little bit like the distribution function, okay? And indeed here on the left-hand side, it looks like the distribution function. I use just 10 Monte Carlo passes and you see that if you shift now your probability distribution, this will just mean that more and more Monte Carlo passes fall into the region where the indicator is one. And when a pass falls into this region, you have this jump. So obviously uh, the dependency on this parameter initial value is a piecewise constant function. And you immediately see that differentiating a piecewise constant function gives you maybe some ugly results. Uh, because you get sometimes zero here, yeah, and sometimes you get some values. So in this example here, I'm using a fairly large shift of the finite difference. So the finite difference is actually not differentiating the function, it's looking at how many points are inside some finite interval. So this means that here on the left-hand side, there is some interval moving across and it's counting the jumps. So if you make the shift size very small, say 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.05 or smaller, uh, it's not very small. Then you see that the derivative suddenly just becomes a function that is always zero, except for some regions where you get the one and the one is just that you count the jump. Okay, and sometimes you get a two, which is 
these locations here where I have in a small region a double jump. Uh, and still with some fantasy, you can see that this could be the density function. So to get a nicer approximation of the density function, maybe I need to make the shift very large. That's now a large shift. Okay, so that looks like a density function, but then this is very coarse, yeah, because you just have a very large moving averaging interval across this. So if you make the shift too small, like in the previous example, then of course you can improve the situation by making the number of passes very large. So these are just 10 passes. Uh, so if I use now uh, 10,000 paths, then the situation looks much better. Still, it is noisy. Huh? And the noise is much larger. And we already looked at uh, the um, reason for this. So we had some, some calculation. So that was here. So actually uh, this is like a Bernoulli experiment where sometimes uh, a path falls into this interval and sometimes not. Yeah, and if it falls into this interval, we are counting the jump and the jump is large if the shift is small. So we are counting large values with a small probability. In expectation, we get the correct result but if you look at the variance, the Monte Carlo error depends on the variance, actually on the square root of the variance, then um, you see that this is uh, a term that is of order one divided by H. So small shifts gives you large variance. So in this example, we have already 10,000 paths. And we have here some variance. And if I use now an even smaller shift, then you see that the variance increases again. Okay. So clearly there is the question, okay, how does um, the calculation of this partial derivative depend on the shift size of the finite difference approximation. Okay, and we concluded the last session by uh, looking at the finite difference method in this way. So on the left-hand side is the object that we like to approximate the partial derivative of the expectation of a function of a random variable that depends on the parameter. So the random variable depends on the parameter. And on the right-hand side is now our finite difference and you see it's, it's, it's actually a pathwise finite difference. Uh, the nice thing is that the method is so generic, so general that we can apply it once we are able to calculate the value as a function of the parameter. So I do not need to know what was the numerical scheme, uh, what is the underlying model, what is the payout function and what is actually the parameter doing. Yeah, I just know that it, it's some parameter and I just apply a shift. The bad properties are, if I choose the shift size too large, finite difference has an approximation error. If I choose the shift size now too small, I get problems from the Monte Carlo approximation. So let's continue here. Um, I see that now 
age plays a role. So small shift sizes are favorable to reduce the finite difference approximation error and large shift sizes may lead uh, to uh, problems. But uh, for, for, for discontinuous uh, function, um, small shift sizes have an issue. because it does not converge. Uh, so maybe I like to start with uh, looking at the dependency. How does the derivative depend on the shift size? And maybe I just like to plot this. Uh, let's plot this for um, a more advanced model. So let's consider just a Black Schultz model. And uh, the function is then maybe uh, the payoff function of a call option or a digital option. So I need to skip here a little bit. Okay, so I like to do the, the following numerical experiment, uh, which we will build up, you know, make it bigger and bigger in the upcoming uh, sessions where we learn more and more methods uh, to plot the dependency here on this uh, shift size or to investigate the accuracy of the approximation of the partial derivative. So I would like to value um, some European product. So here European means that the dependency is only on a single time, a single future time, capital T. And I would like to value here some financial product. So the financial product is given here by this function. So actually it's a general setup, a function of a random variable. I like to value that. And now we are looking at this where S is driven by a Black Scholz model. So you know that here under the Black Scholz model, I immediately know that S of capital T is S zero, the initial value multiplied with the exponential, and then it is here R times delta T. So R times capital T minus one half sigma squared capital T. Okay, that's the drift plus sigma W of capital T. Okay, so I immediately know the um, dependency. Uh, so I immediately know the solution. Uh, so we know how S of capital T looks like. And now if you have a function of this, uh, I'm interested in calculating for different such functions, say the zero bond, which is just unit one times the ratio of the numerator. Okay, so ratio of the numerator, just to recall this in the Black Schultz model. This is just e to the minus r. Okay, so maybe I take a plus. So in the Black Schultz model, this is just e to the r uh, t minus t. Okay, so maybe I take the minus. Minus is nicer. Okay, so in the Black Schultz model, this is just e to the minus r capital T minus t. Yeah, so the time to maturity. So the n is the uh, e to the r t.
So I like to uh, investigate now um, different such functions. So the zero bond, which pays you just a unit one, the forward that pays you just the difference of the stock and the constant, the option that takes you the maximum of this, 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 uh, this difference and zero. Okay, so I have here the maximum function and the digital option, which pays you one if S is larger than K, otherwise zero. So if you like to have small illustrations of these guys here, so then if you neglect the scaling factor with the N, okay, that's just a constant. Okay, then this here is just a constant one. This guy here is just a linear function which has slope one and well, it depends a little bit on the K where we intersect. Okay, so maybe it goes below zero. So to distinguish it from the option, then the option has a kink. at this location. So it looks like that. So it's also not differentiable in this location. And the digital option has a jump at this location. Okay, so and maybe let's uh, try just the finite difference applied to one of these. And then in the next session, we can maybe explore this a little bit more. Okay, so let's create here a new program. I need some main method. Let's call this, well, we are looking at Monte Carlo. So this is Monte Carlo. Then we are looking at the Black-Scholes model. This is Black-Scholes. And then we are interested in calculating the delta So the delta is the partial derivative of the value with respect to the initial value as zero. So I like to calculate dv by d as zero, as zero is the initial value, and that is in mathematical finance, often called the delta of the financial product of this option. So I like to calculate the delta. So let's call this then delta uh, experiment or experiments. Okay, so let's build uh, the model. So one second, I have a. So I have to check what parameters I use, like to use, okay, yeah. The parameters are also here in the script. Oh, there's a suggestion. So let's build a black Schultz model. We already have these components, so I just can uh, combine them. So I would like to use a model which has initial value 100. Uh, the parameter R, the risk-free rate should be 5%. Then the parameter volatility of the Black Schultz model should be 30%. Okay. So these are my model parameters. And now let's create such a model as a Monte Carlo simulation. So I create a model with these parameters. Uh, so the parameter initial value, volatility, uh, risk-free rate and volatility. Okay. 
Okay, so what else do I need? I need some parameters for my time discretization. I like to do an Euler scheme. So then we have some uh, time horizon for the time discretization. So that should be the same as the maturity of the option. Let's choose for the maturity of the option uh, 5.0, so five years. So I have a time to horizon here. Uh, and then I also need a time discretization. So a DT, a delta T, uh, let's just also use uh, 5.0. So I just have one time step because it is an European option. And uh, then I would like to have a Monte Carlo simulation. So I also need a number that specifies how many sample passes we use. So the number of paths is say 10,000. So I like to have now a Monte Carlo simulation with these parameters. So my Euler scheme has a time horizon that corresponds to the Uh, maturity and a time step size that gives me one time step and a certain number of paths. Okay, so I like to create now um, a Black Schultz model. Uh, so maybe I can here write Black Schultz uh, with these uh, parameters. So this is now my model. So let's create this uh, function. Okay, so how do we do this? So we have all the building blocks. So the first building block is I need a Brownian motion. So the Brownian motion is say, let's use here Mess and Twister as uh, the random number generator, then the pound in motion requires a time discretization. So let's choose the one that can be specified by initial value, uh, then the number of time steps and then the time step size. So let's check if that is correct. Initial value, number of time steps, time step size, okay. So the initial value is zero, the number of time steps is one, and the, uh, so that is the initial time, yeah? So sorry, I said initial value, but initial value is the initial value of the stochastic process. So my time step discretization starts in zero, has one time step, has step size delta t, so delta t is just uh 5.0, so it will end at the maturity. Maybe I also use here maturity to make this less redundant. Okay, so then I have a Brown in motion. So this parameter here is the number of factors. It's just a one factor Brown in motion with that many paths. And here is the Monte Carlo seed. Uh, so let's specify here the seed and maybe also add that as a parameter here. So let's add this here. So then we have all parameters here on the top. So some, some seed. Yeah. Okay, so now we have created the Brownian motion. So now I need um, a model that uses the Brownian motion and uh, 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 that we use in the Euler scheme together with the Brownian motion. So this is my Black Schultz model. So there is a class Okay, so there is a class that creates now the model. So the specification of the drift, the sigma parameter, the initial value, 
the state space transform, whatever we need for our Euler scheme, uh, depending on the initial value, the risk free rate and the volatility. So we have these parameters. This is my Monte Carlo process model. Oh no, it's not called that. How is it called? It's cloud. I believe it's process model. Huh? Okay, so yeah, so we can call this generic ID process model. And that's now, and these two guys are now the argument to my Euler scheme. Okay, so this needs the Black Schultz model and the pawn emotions, and that's it. And um, this is already the process that provides you now with the simulation of the stock. And um, to get a nice wrapper that will give, give us also the numerea and the stock in a single uh, object, I can wrap this now. in this, this class. So what we get back here uh, with this model or Monte Carlo model or Black Schultz model is now some class or some object, is now some object that gives us the asset value. This is the S of capital T that we like to have. And it also gives us the numeria. So having this guy, I can value the function. So I can, I can value the financial product. So I like to uh, calculate the value of the financial product. So this is maybe some other function, which I call now get value of UP product and let's pass the maturity as an argument and the model. Okay, and then maybe let's let's print the value. Okay, so let's add here this implementation of the valuation now. Okay, so I have the model, so I can ask the model for the random variable that is the underlying. Yeah, so this is our S of T. So this is give me S at maturity. And then if my financial product is now the um, forward, I would calculate the payoff. So as uh, the underlying minus the strike. Okay, so I need the parameter strike. the K, so let's add here the parameter of the product. Maybe I use some larger number. So my initial value is 100. So I use maybe 125, okay, which is approximately 5% in every year. Yeah. So 
quite quite a value in the middle. Okay, so let's let's also pass this strike to my valuation. Okay, so let's um, then multiply the payoff with the ratio of the numeraire. So in the script, the n of little t divided by n of t. So this is So this is then the discounted payoff. So this is the payoff multiplied with the numeraire at evaluation time. So evaluation time is just zero divided by, so this is my little t, divided by the numeraire at maturity. And then I return the expectation. So what doesn't, okay, I need, I need to do some exception handling. Okay, then I return the expectation. So I return the expectation and from that, the double value. So, and he requires some uh, exception handling here. Uh, so just be a little bit uh, brutal and catch all kind of exceptions that occur. And in that case, I return just uh, not a number. So something, something has happened if you cannot calculate it. Okay, so now I have here a way of calculating the Monte Carlo value of this European product. And the European product is currently the forward. So let's call this here forward. I will rename it back. Uh, maybe I compare it with the analytic value. So the analytic value of the Plex-Schulz model, I have here a Plex-Schulz uh, option value with the initial value of the stock, the risk free rate, the volatility, the maturity and the strike. So that should be the initial value of an option. Um, okay, so this is the initial value, ah, okay. so. The, I need the initial value of the forward. So the initial value of the forward This is just the expectation of S of T times N of little t divided by N of capital T. That is just S zero. So that is just the initial value. Minus K multiplied with the expectation of E to the minus R capital T minus little t. So that is just minus strike multiplied with exponential minus R times T. So that should be the analytic value. I hope let's get, let's have fingers crossed. Okay. Yeah, may add a few more dots here. Okay, so if I add more Monte Carlo passes, say 100,000, yeah, you see there is some convergence. Okay, so with 10,000, I'm a little bit off. With 100,000, there is some convergence. So it looks quite good, yeah? So 1 million. 
No, it looks quite good. Okay, so there is a numerical error. No, there is a gap, but that looks like I'm calculating the right value here. Um, if I like to calculate different financial products, maybe I can make this here a little bit more general by just providing uh, many different functions f to this um, method here. So instead of just providing here the strike, I would like to provide um, a function, a random app operator, um, that is the payoff function. And you can specify this random operator here. for the forward. So this is the underlying is mapped to underlying minus strike. Okay, and then instead of passing here the strike, I just pass this function. Okay, so instead of then calculating here the payoff explicitly as underlying minus strike, I just say, okay, use this function with as of t. So this is now the general form of an European product. That has this pay of function using s of capital T, where s is provided by this model. So we have a very generic way of calculating now the value of different financial products. So I can also calculate here the payoff of an option. So a call option. So a call option is just S minus K. And then I take maximum of this and zero. So this is called floor zero. And if I pass this here to my valuation function, so let's call this here value forward. So then I also print this value forward. And now I call this here value call option. Okay, so then I just need to pass this function there. Maybe I move this here. Okay, and I can calculate the value of uh, a call option, yeah? So I just can pass now different functions f. Um, so the value of this call option analytically calculated uses the plec schultz model. So I have a formula for this. This is the plec schultz model option. Black Scholes option value. Okay, so here it is with the initial value, the risk free rate, the volatility, the maturity, and the strike. Okay, so that should be the right formula. So let's plot these two guys now here below. So this here is the forward. And this here is now the call option. Let's check if this works. Yeah, looks also quite good. Okay, so we get some values for these uh, financial product. Of course, if you have the maximum function applied to this payoff, you cut off the negative values and you get a higher, higher amount, you get a higher value. So, but now I'd like to calculate the finite difference of this valuation function. So I would like to use this general function here and calculate um, a finite difference. And I would like to plot the dependency of the finite difference on a certain shift. So let's first calculate um, 
the delta, so the finite difference approximation. So this is the delta of the call option using finite difference. Get delta. Okay, so, and I just provide here the same stuff. And in addition, I also provide the shift. Let's use some shift size. Okay, so let's use some shift size. Um, oops. And implement this method that calculates now the delta using finite differences. And I would like to calculate it in a very generic way because I mentioned that the nice thing about this method is that it is so generic. And can we actually calculate everything just using these arguments here uh, without further knowledge? Uh, and in this implementation here, it's actually possible. Okay, so what do I need? I need a model that has a shifted initial value. And there is uh, a method that does this. There is here a method that allows me to create um, a copy of this model with a, a parameter shifted. So it just creates a new model with a different uh, initial value. Maybe I need to check this. Oh, yeah, okay. So you need to pass here a map that has the new parameters. And the new parameter is the initial value. So this is just the same name that you pass here when you create the model. Okay, so just the same name that you pass here. Okay, and I need a new initial value and my new initial value is the old initial value plus the shift. So that is my upshifted model. Of course, I need the old initial value, but I can just ask the model, okay, give me your um, initial value. So I need the value at time zero. So then I have a, a model that uses the upshifted initial value and I can calculate the And I can now calculate the valuation, the expectation under this new upshifted model. So the model with a different initial value. So this is just, I call my valuation function. So that guy here, with this new model, it's the same maturity. And of course, it's also the same payoff function. So this is just a general payoff function, not the one of the call options, or maybe I should call it that way. So I need some exception handling here. Let's uh, do it in the same total way as we did here below. So I catch everything. Okay, and then do the same stuff here with a downshift. 
So this is now my downshifted model. This is the initial value minus the shift. So this gives me the downshifted value and I can just return the finite difference. So the finite difference is value upshift minus value downshift and divided by the shift size divided by two because I have uh, centered finite difference. Well, okay. So now we have a very generic code. Yeah? So you can pass here in any model uh, and just any payoff function. And as long as the model is able to create a new version of itself with the shifted value, uh, I can calculate, sorry here, there should be the downshifted of course used in the financial, the downshifted model used in the financial, in the expectation. Um, so as long as um, the model is able to perform this upshift and downshift, so create a new version, uh, you can you can you can just calculate the uh, finite difference. So of course here I also could just use my get Black Scholes model with a different initial value. So I just was too lazy to pass all the parameters. Uh, yeah, so this here is now my approximation of the delta. Let's let's check that if that works, and then we are done with this small experiment. Uh, so this here is now the delta of the call option. Uh, let's print the delta of the call option using finite differences, and I also like to have here another analytic value. So where do we get this analytic value? So there's also a formula that calculates the delta. So you can differ, just differentiate black -Scholes formula to get this. So this is analytic formulas, get Black-Scholes delta, Black-Scholes uh, option delta. Okay, there it is. So this is the initial value, the risk free rate, the volatility, the maturity and the strike as a parameter to this formula. Yeah, so if you look inside here, it's just uh, differentiating, uh, it's just differentiating Black-Scholes formula. Okay, so let's check if this works. Okay, so this looks also good. Yeah? I do a generic finite difference approximation to my evaluation and it looks very similar to the analytic value. So maybe have a small new line here to have the output a bit nicer. And also here for the next one. And here. Maybe you can move that here. So. Okay, so now was the question uh, that we have this, we can uh, play a little bit with this and explore this. What is the dependency on the shift? Okay, so what is the dependency of the shift? If I make the shift small, this stays quite stable. Okay, so we see there is no issue here. So actually if I make it even smaller, so just remember here the number six, four, and at the end, two, eight, eight, I make it a little bit smaller. Yeah, six, four, so there are small changes here. Let's make it larger. Okay, so it looks over a wide range, it works very stable. If we make the shift very large, say 10, Still it is okay, okay. Looks within the Monte Carlo error, 
100. Okay, then we get some bias. Huh? Okay, so what is the dependency of the shift size? So let's plot this. So create a small function, plot data as a function of the shift size and mm, Okay, so, and you see that the shift stays, uh, um, the, the delta stays stable for very many different of such shifts. So maybe I would like to vary the shift size on a log scale. So as we did it for the uh, session where we had this issue with the computer arithmetic. So 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five for shifts. So I like to define a function that depends on the scale of the shift. Okay, and now the shift is just a 10 to the minus scale. So the shift size for my finite difference is now just a 10 to the minus scale or, or a 10 to the scale, yeah? So I, my scale is then minus two, minus three, yeah? So that's maybe nicer for the plot. So the small numbers will be on the left and the right numbers, the, the large numbers will be on the right, yeah? The minus 10 is then a small shift. Okay, so let's, let's use that for my uh, shift. Uh, may, maybe it's better to have the shift as a relative shift of the initial value. So maybe I add here the initial value and say my shift is S zero times 10 to the minus. Yeah? So because my, my S zero is already at 100. So that's maybe, maybe nice. Um, and then I like to return the finite difference approximation of my European product. So my get delta of the European product using this shift. So I pass here the same parameters as for that function. And uh, of course this function needs then the same parameters. Okay, so I need the model, the maturity, the payoff function. Okay, I do not need the shift because now the shift is here a function and I like to plot that. Actually, the initial value, I can just calculate it in the same way as I did here. I can just ask the model for the um, initial value. Okay, and this needs some renaming. Okay, so now I like to plot the delta as a function of the shift size for my Plex-Schultz model using 5.0 as maturity using the payoff function that corresponds to the call option. So maximum of S, T minus K and zero. Okay, so I pass this argument. Okay, and maybe I also need some exception handling. Yeah, I don't care about that for a moment. Yeah, this is just an experiment here. Um, so now I, I have the function that maps this scale parameter to um, a delta, and now I just like to plot this. So I have a nice little helper. So let's plot a two dimensional plot, say from minus 13 
to minus one. Let me let me check in the script. Did I use that? So I have the same thing as in the script. Um, using this function, Oops, so. And then I can show this plot. So let's keep fingers crossed and check how this plot uh, looks like. Okay, so this looks like that. Okay, so maybe I Is it, is it the same as I had in my script? Huh? Because that would be nice. Oh, it's the same. Uh, 10,000 passes I use. So how many passes I use here? Uh, it's the same, okay. Okay, so maybe I like to add a small, small description to the plot. So let's add some title. So this is the finite difference approximation of delta of, uh, so now this is um, a European Ah, okay, so since this here is a generic product, I do not know the product. Okay, so maybe let's do the title when I uh, use this function. So I just return here the plot. So maybe I just return the plot. That's, that's maybe a nice idea. Okay, because then I can here add the title and the description. So what's that? Okay, so here I know it's a call option. So now I can set the title here. The title is now, this is the finite difference approximation of a European call option as a function of the shift size. Okay, maybe I add here the description of the axis. So this X axis here is the scale. So the scale of the shift, this means shift is uh, S zero uh, multiplied with uh, 10 to the minus scale. Or 10 to the scale, so this is correct. Okay, scale goes from minus to 20, 13 to one. And the y-axis is the delta, or the finite difference approximation. Okay, so we have this picture now here, yeah, where we see if the shift becomes small, we get issues. Well, these issues, we already know them. They come from, um, where they come from computer arithmetic. It's the same issue that we have for finite differences when we take shifts where we get into the region where the machine precision creates issues, okay? 
And then we see on the right hand side, if the shift becomes too large, okay, then we get a problem from the finite difference being no longer accurate enough. So from the remainder of the Taylor expansion. Okay, so now uh, we had the motivation that finite differences get gets an issue if I use a discontinuous function. So how does now this dependency look like when I have a discontinuous function? And this is now an easy task because now I can just create another payoff function and just use here the same method. So let's create a new payoff function that corresponds to the digital option. So this is the payoff of the digital option. Okay, so what's that? That is S maps to the indicator function. So the indicator function that is one if S minus K is positive. So this is here just choose between one and zero. So we already had this. So we just use the choose function. That's the indicator function. Okay, and nice thing, I can just now pass this call option into my generic plotting routine here to create another plot. So this is, uh, say, the plot of the digital. This here is the plot of the call option. Okay, and I get this if I now pass here instead of the payoff function, uh, I pass here of the call option, I just pass here the payoff function of the digital option. So this is now the finite difference approximation of a digital option. Okay, and um, how does the plot look like? Let's, let's, let's run the program. So left-hand side, my European option, right-hand side, my digital option. So for the European option, you see that you can choose the shift size very small, okay? And of course, you are not allowed to choose it too small because there is this issue with the instability coming from the computer arithmetic. Of course, you also know that you are not allowed to use it too large, but there's a very fairly large region here uh, where uh, the shift gives you a stable result. Well, you see that all these numbers here are the same. So maybe I should change the uh, resolution of this um, by changing the number format. So let's use just more digits. Okay, so you see that here we have small changes. Actually, the changes here are maybe still in the region of the Monte Carlo error if we are um, in this region. Yeah, so you know, you see the analytic solution is 6, 4, 
643. Yeah, so 6463, actually, we are still away from the Monte Carlo error. So everything inside here is fine. Even this guy here is still not so bad. Yeah. But the noise will will start uh, if you if you move further further to the uh, other side. Uh, but for the digital option, the behavior is really different. Uh, all the values here give me a wrong value, give me zero. Uh, and then we have this huge noise popping in at even very large shift sizes, 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus four. It's, it's still uh, uh, it's a fairly large number, yeah. Um, and then at 10 to the minus two, maybe you observe some uh, convergence. So that's already the region where you get here errors from the Taylor expansion for the European call option. So you see that the digital option has a problem with small shift sizes. And let's conclude by just discussing these two pictures. And then in the next session, we will discuss the method that fix these problems. So a method where you can also use small shift sizes, for example, for discontinuous functions. Um, and uh, I will continue to use this program to investigate these other methods. Uh, so that was maybe the reason that building up this program took a little bit longer, but now we have some kind of platform where we can analyze. Yeah? And I will just exchange, here in the program, I will just exchange the way of calculating here this delta approximation. So let's conclude by discussing the two pictures in the script. So um, I used here in the script a slightly different scaling, but more or less it's the same picture. You can just repeat the experiment. Uh, the experiment is, of course, in our Git repo. So you can play with this code uh, and also with the code that we will add in the next session when we um, create the likelihood ratio method, the pathwise method, and so on. So we do that in the next session. So we had this picture for the delta of a European call option is a function of the shift size. Okay, unfortunately the x-axis description is not here. So what's the situation that is happening here? So I'm calculating here the delta of a call option using finite differences. So the call option is here this function, maximum of s minus k and zero. Uh, so if this here is my k, yeah, then the function looks like that. I have a zero here and then I have a linear function here, right? Okay, and now I use finite differences and finite differences means that you have an upshift value, maybe this one here, and a downshift value and they are close together as long as you look at the same path and you calculate then the finite difference. So here you will calculate this slope but then on other points, you have here the upshift value and here the downshift value. And you will calculate this slope. And actually now you see that these small slopes, you have a combination of slopes. Some slopes are zero, some slopes are one. Yeah? So this slope here is zero, this slope is one. Uh, but that does not depend a lot on the shift size. So the shift size h is here this distance, okay? So you see that actually this is fairly independent of the shift size.
Well, as long as the shift size does not become too small, because then you get instabilities. from rounding errors. Yeah, so this is our IEEE 754.4.1. Computer arithmetic stuff we did. Uh, but if you have a large shift size, then it may happen that the upshift and the downshift are on different sides of the kink. And then you suddenly get another slope. And this is what is actually happening here. Because you see that here, suddenly you get a change in the value. Yeah? And this is the point where some passes, some path start to jump across the kink. So upon shifting, so when we when we shift. Okay, so, uh, but you can use fairly large shifts and just also know now that this depends a little bit on the um, number of passes. For the digital option, the picture is very similar. Yeah, so my picture is now like that. Okay, so I'm zero here. Then I jump to one. But now you see that all the guys that are on the same side, they do not have any contribution to the slope. Say so all sample is zero. And we have this strange Bernoulli experiment where we are actually really interested in crossing the jump. And we get a large slope. The slope here is one divided by two H. Okay, so it's a one minus zero divided by two H. Okay, and this point here is the point where the first path crosses the jump. Okay, so actually you can also now calculate this number here. So this number here that you see there, what, what is it? One path has crossed the jump. So it is one divided by two H and then we have all the times, uh, all the others are zero. So it is times one divided by number of passes. Okay, so, and then uh, you have another guy that crosses the jump. if you make the shift size larger and you get some convergence. So actually this here is the analytic value.
Uh, and also for the call option, I have plotted the analytic value. So that's actually the reason why the scale of the axis looks a little bit different here because I still have that guy here. So by here, you see that this distance here is still the Monte Carlo error. So you see for large uh, ranges of the shift, the approximation is perfectly okay. And the Monte Carlo error is actually doing the actually the dominating part. Here you see that uh, this instability from the discontinuity is really an issue and you have convergence to the Monte Carlo uh, of, of the Monte Carlo approximation to the analytic value for really very large shift sizes. So next session is, can we find a numerical method that allows me to calculate uh, the delta of a discontinuous function. So the partial derivative of the expectation of a discontinuous function of a random variable that depends on a parameter more accurately. And the nice thing is that we will observe there is some duality. So this other method, the likelihood ratio method, for example, uh, which we also can implement in a very generic way, which is part of your project. Um, this works very nice for discontinuous function but it performs poor for smooth functions. So it's exactly the opposite. So that was it for today.